Okay, Croiso, welcome to you. Welcome to The Influencers with myself, Chris Jones. Now then, my guest this month, the month of December, to finish this year of 2021 is, well, a fellow Welsh person, first of all, but, but she is Claire Sanderson. Claire is a journalist and editor-in-chief of Women's Health magazine. Claire, Croiso, welcome, first of all. Thank you, Dior Barrow. Thank you for having me. Well, yeah, I, now, I must admit, I've never read Women's Health magazine, okay, maybe I should have before coming on here, but Women's Health magazine is is regarded as a very influential publication, and you as editor-in-chief are then a very influential person. Does that, Claire, come with its own pressures, with its own intensities, as it were? Well, yes, because my my role is in fact um, in charge of the entire brand. So I'm responsible for the strategy and success of Women's Health across all its many platforms. So there's the magazine, as you mentioned, but we also have a website which attracts almost 7 million unique users a month. We have millions of followers on social media. We also do events. Um, responsible for the success of commercials. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, plates to spin simultaneously, all while being a mum to two young children. So it certainly does have immense pressure, but there's also the pressure that you are creating content about health that obviously is a serious subject. Women take the content seriously and use it to empower themselves to make changes in their lives so there's a huge responsibility on my shoulders to ensure that the content that we're putting out there is credible science backed and sure. there's not any any element of fake news in it which you can find across the internet and other other websites when it comes to health ours is all responsible credible health content okay well well you hit the nail on the head in a way because we'll talk about how you juggle things because you're obviously a, a juggler but has have those pressures, um, has your responsibilities, if you like, uh, on the content of the mag magazine changed over the years um, recently because of what's happened the last 18 months? Well, they've changed over the years in that when I first joined five years ago, it'll be five years on January the 16th, so next month, um, when I first joined, I was editor of the magazine, um, which itself is, is a beast with a, the most influential health publishing brand for women globally. So that's a huge, um, a huge responsibility on my shoulders. But then I was promoted to editor in chief 18 months later. So I took on responsibility for the entire brand. And then you mentioned how it may have changed over the last 18 months, two years. Well, yes, it has, because when COVID first hit and we were all sent to work from home, um, everyone went onto the web to get their health content. So we saw our traffic on the website go absolutely bananas um, almost overnight. Um, we put on a virtual event last April where I convinced the likes of Davina McCall, Gemma Atkinson to film workouts from their living rooms because no one could go anywhere. And we put these videos um, across our social media um, channels and it got 11 million views. Oh it God. was it was really quite incredible. So um, we realised that women were turning to us to be informed and entertained and to keep moving because we were all just working out in our living rooms, etc. So, um, yeah, the 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 shift in, in digital traffic was enormous at that time. So in which case, then, I, I mean, again, with all respect, it begs the question, is there a future for the actual magazine? Absolutely. We, we still do very well in print. And one of the reasons for that is I view the magazine as the foundation of the brand. I think the trust in the brand is born in print. And there's actually a lot of research to back this up that says people are 70% more likely to trust something they read in print than they are on um, the internet because content in print goes through uh, editorial scrutiny and a, and a labored editorial process, it's thoroughly researched, et cetera. So I think the trust and the deep trust that women have with women's health comes from the magazine. Um, another thing that we saw at the beginning of COVID is our subscribers almost doubled overnight as well. So people couldn't get out of the shop, so they subscribed to the magazine instead. So they still wanted it in their hands. Um, that said, publishing has been challenged, like many other industries, by, by uh, commercial industries, by COVID, but, but women's health is still doing 
very well. And in fact, we now have a bigger brand footprint now than we ever have. So there's a there's a men's health magazine as well. So do you as editor in chief have have a, a tea and cakes and whatever and have a bit of a chat with the editor in chief of men's health? So the editor in chief of men's health, the lovely chap called Toby Wiseman. And we when we were in the office pre-COVID, we all used to sit together and um the difference between men's health and women's health was quite stark because in comparison to men's health, women's health staff are a bit like having a hen party every day because we were chatty women, you know. <laughs> Whereas men's health are quite sort of head down, serious, get on with it. Um, but we get on with them very well um, and we we learn off each other and we there's, there's certain projects that we do. For instance, we just launched a membership scheme called the Women's Health Collective and men's health launched their own membership scheme called Scheme called Men's Health Squad several months ago. So I'm taking learnings from him. So there's a healthy rivalry, but also a, a very healthy working relationship where we encourage each other. But but do you think that, I mean, it sounds a daft question. Do, do women read men's health and men's health, uh, men read women's health? Is there a, like a, you know, a, a, a sort of um, an interest in both, as it were, from both sexes? Well, I certainly read men's health. I think, I, I, I know friends who read men's health because their other half buys it. I don't know if men would actually go out and buy women's health unless they particularly like the cover star that month, etc. It's certainly, not, it's certainly not something that we chart. You know, when we um, we do audience surveys and stuff, it's very much we 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 consider our audience women. Okay, before moving, are you just brought up a, a, an interesting point there? Whoever the cover star on the cover was. Is there is there any research or any sort of um, content whatsoever that says a person buys the magazine according to whoever's actually on the cover? Never mind the content, they buy it and they just see, I don't know, Halle Berry or whoever on the cover and they buy it just for that. Yes, so we can see a big shift in sales if the cover star has is, is on point. So whoever goes on the cover is completely my responsibility and I book them as well. I deal with their management, et cetera, to, to book them. I don't have an entertainment director. Um, a lot of it is gut, but also a lot of it is learning to take from our social media channels. So often I test people on our social media channels. I might get put a post up and see what the reaction is to see if it would be someone that was suitable for the cover. And then a, a good cover star can dramatically influence sales. So um, a cover star that we put on exactly a year ago massively boosted sales. And that was Oti Mabuse from Strictly, uh -huh. whom I love. Um, I think she won with Bill Bailey, you may remember, if you're a Strictly fan right. last year. So everything was going for us. Like she was kept on getting through every week. And I was like, Will and they're on, saying, stay on the show, because we were on sale at the time. But that that magazine was was double, high double figures up year on year. So um, at the right cover star can really influence sales. OK, then um, again, at the risk of sounding a bit tough here, we, uh, Women's Health magazine, uh, who does it actually appeal to? Is it a particular audience? Is it a particular message? And is yeah. it for all women? A lot of questions there. So, so yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's for all women who want to be the best version of their healthy selves. That's our, our brand mantra. The, the, the key demographic, so the, the core average in print is, is a woman in her late 30s, early 40s, who wants to make the best of herself physically and mentally. We're not a fitness magazine. People think that we're just a fitness. Well, sometimes we get misunderstood as a fitness brand. We're not. We're a holistic health brand. We, I give mental health um, equal footing to nutrition and fitness across the brand that's equally as important for you to be truly healthy you need to be holistically healthy so it is a woman who wants to make um, themselves feel and be healthier so in print understandably because I think the print audience is slightly older um, it's it's late 30s early 40s that's the core but I know that we've got readers from 18 right up to early 60s and beyond, because people are getting younger in themselves. We're all engaging in our wellness much more than we, we ever have. And, you know, age is, is just a number. You know, women can be amazingly fit and healthy and look amazing in their 50s, 60s and beyond. Likewise, you've got 18 year olds going to university who are really 
really into training whereas when I went to uni which admittedly was 25 years ago people were more concerned with going down the union and paying a pound for a pint you know I think there's a yeah. there's a yeah. definite different mentality amongst the younger crowds these days the the binge drinking is not as endemic as it was when I was younger and I think um social media has a lot to do with that but I think young people these days um are much healthier than when I was in university. Oh yeah, oh, I totally agree. I mean, I've got four kids and, and one in university now and she's nothing like like I was in university. Yeah. But, uh, so do, does fashion come into the magazine at all? Is, is there a, you know, you talk about health and, and but is beauty and fashion part of it or is that yeah. on sidelines as it were? No, beauty is a core content pillar, but we, we tackle beauty from a health perspective. So we wouldn't yeah. talk about the eye colour shadow eyeshadow color of the season for instance we talk about skin health or hair health or we talk about you know the new wonder ingredients in skincare that can change your skin etc so it's a more of a deep dive into the science of beauty as opposed to makeup that is simply there for aesthetic purposes and then with fashion um it's it's more at leisure I don't know if you know that phrase but more fit kits so um yes we do do fashion shoots but they tend to be leggings and tops if they're the fashion shoots will go for the more high-end sort of fashiony leggings which everyone wears leggings seven days a week now you know and it used to be that you'd only wear your fit kit training but now everyone just lives in them but then also the type of content that does really well online is is looking into the the fundamentals of leggings so you know leggings with pockets in so you can put your phone on or phone in when you go running or leggings that can survive the squat test because I don't know if you know that's a thing Chris but there are some leggings that when you're squatting they become somewhat transparent and that's a bit embarrassing in the gym so <laughs> all right okay <laughs> all right honestly I'm trying to imagine that now yeah yeah I'm not too hard honestly but, but um well well okay well, let's talk about you know fashion beauty health and it's all obviously you know important but i i've got three daughters okay yeah. do, do you do you think there's still in this day and age an enormous pressure on on young girls young women of all ages to have this how can i put this to put the, have this perfect life in inverted commas because instagram as as well let's talk about social media the role of social media as well the dangers of the social media everyone wants this perfect instagrammable life don't they so it, 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 do you still think there's a danger have you got a responsibility about yeah. that kind of thing so we really try hard to represent a broad demographic of women both in body shape age body abilities etc um i think the younger people these days, yes, there's they're growing up in a world where people put a very filtered representation of their life on social media. But I also think there's an awareness under the younger generations that it is a falsehood. Um, I was only speaking to a mum at um, my son's rugby game last Sunday, and she was saying that her daughter, who's in the second year of high school, is is slightly larger than her friends because her dad is a tall stocky bloke but he said but um my friend said she's very body positive because that's what the younger girls are these days they they're owning their body shape and they're owning their uniqueness so i'm oh, hoping gosh. that um we're moving out of that kind of love island aesthetic which i think really took over for some time and a lot of girls were trying to look like that very altered you know physical representation sure, of a woman understand. with yeah. the, the big lips, etc. And I'm hoping that well, I'm learning from from speaking to, to friends who have teenage girls that there's a there's a quiet confidence coming through. But are you always aware of that as editor in chief? And as you say, there's always something, isn't there? It's, if it's not big lips, it's it's big bottoms or big boobs or big hair, whatever. Are you yeah. always aware of that? Yes. Yeah, so we, we we wouldn't include anyone in the brand who has clearly made obvious changes to their body we we want women to embrace their their natural selves um we have a, a campaign a long-running campaign called project body love and it's a content campaign that was created by women's health that lives across um various health brands including red l cosmo and good housekeeping and it's um it's all content created to empower women to embrace their healthy selves um so i have a we, we don't retouch our covers. We, we certainly wouldn't change body shape or any of that. We, we have to bring images 
back to life is a phrase in in the media so sometimes when they're shot with a um a big flash it can um make the skin look like an unnatural color and stuff so we have to restore um images back to their what they would be but we won't definitely would would never photoshop you know any rolls of fat or anything like that because we want women to see women what they really look like but you then i mean i've seen you on instagram you you're a very influential editor-in-chief in that case because you lead by example don't you really uh you know you you i know you you're into your exercise and your your fitness and everything and you you always look amazing but with all respect you you're not always made up for you really no i'm i'm that's really important to me to put a very normal lens of what my life is on Instagram. So I don't think twice about putting putting pictures up with no makeup on. I did one this morning. I think, well, this is me. I'm in my mid forties. I don't look too bad. So I'm just gonna, I'll just put pictures up, you know, makeup free, hair scraped back. I'm very honest in my captions about my state of mind that day. If I'm feeling rubbish about myself. I live with what I would describe as low level depression and, and the way I manage that is through good nutrition and exercise. So if I've been struggling with my mental health, I'll talk about that on there. And I always get a very positive response, both in the captions and also privately women message me to say how much they appreciate me being so honest, because I think people think that an editor in chief's life is just constant glam. Well, it's not. I'm at home working at home three days a week I'm on my own with two young children because my husband doesn't live with me during the week you know so I'm doing the school run etc then rushing back then trying to do a workout I didn't work out this morning I'm still sat here in my sweaty clothes you know it's it's (laughs) certainly not (laughs) no makeup you know not made that much for you yeah but that's 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 true that's 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 real life though isn't it that that's that that is true to true to life I mean you talk about you you're a busy mum and how the hell do you juggle everything if you are on your own and uh, do you are you a ma- are you one of these master organizers who's got everything well, on paper i well no i i should be more organized in that respect actually i think <sighs> um yeah so I, I do let things slip i just one of my great strengths i think is that i don't get stressed by work and and i sometimes get stressed by my kids but there needs to be an absolute tsunami happening for me to get stressed by work so i think that allows me to just calmly get through the day you know once i drop the kids off they go to breakfast club every day they love it apparently the toast is better in school than here (laughs) the the cereal is better in school than here they're nine and six you know so everything everything's cooler than bum isn't it so um so i take them to school at eight o'clock and once they're out of my hair um, working from home actually gives me more time. When I was five days a week in the office pre-COVID, not only did I have to employ people to help me look after the kids, it was just one big rush, you know, on the train in the morning, up to London, working all day. I live in Winchester, by the way, which is an hour outside London, not getting back till eight o'clock at night, then trying to do the washing. I don't know how I did it. So obviously COVID is an absolutely devastating thing that's happened. But I think what it did do is give some people a semblance of control back over their lives because working from home, certainly for, for working mothers, I think has, has eased the pressures and, uh, and allowed us to be mums and managers, yeah. colleagues, etc. And good jugglers. But but do you, do you see yourself going back to the normality that was before? Do you think do you see yourself do you see things going back to well, I still say normal to how it was pre-COVID. Certainly not for the company I work for at the moment because we're back in the office two days a week. So it's a mandatory two days a week. And then if we want to go in for any more, then we can, oh. because I know there are some people who their home environment is not favourable with working from home. You know, if you're living in a shared house in your early 20s and the Wi-Fi is being shared by five people and you have to sit in your bedroom, that's a bit grim, isn't it? You'd rather go into the office. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm you know, fortunate to live in a nice house in Winchester. Um, so I'm choosing to go in two days a week and I'm working from home three days a week and that balance suits me and I know other media organizations are taking the same approach so I think 
and the this whole hybrid working model uh, has given people the, the power to negotiate if they do move into new in new companies so I certainly if I was to move on from Hearst which I have no immediate plans to do so it's a wonderful company to work for but if I was to move on I would certainly try and negotiate um, a hybrid working pattern. Okay oh excellent that's really interesting um, before we have a little break then um from your accent, obviously, you're, you're, you're Welsh, you're from Abercunnon, which uh, maybe some people have no idea what Abercunnon is. It's it, it's basically South Wales Valleys near, well, where was it? Near Aberdeer, near, near yes. Merthyr, it's not Ponty. that right. Ponty, yeah. yeah, so it's proper proper valleys, as it were. Yeah. Now, you, you, live, you live in Winchester, you haven't been in Wales for, for quite a while. Do you find yourself becoming more welsh if you like and i saw a picture of yourself and your, and your son there the player watching the rugby recently do you, do you find yourself becoming more welsh because you're not in wales there's, there's a phrase in welsh um god i come the country which means the best welshman is from you know outside of wales as it were do you sell do you see yourself as uh, as becoming more welsh or less welsh oh definitely not less welsh no um i made a very conscious decision not to lose my accent when i went to university in london when i was 18 I know when I go back to Abercunnell and they think I sound slightly posh, which is ridiculous because <laughs> up here I sound very Welsh. Um, but I'm just a very passionate Welsh woman. I'm a massive fan of, of Wales rugby. I've always gone to all the, the home games and I'll take my son. He's nine. He's Winchester born and bred, but a very passionate Wales rugby fan. In fact, my, my husband took him to watch England played Tonga and he was supporting Tonga the whole time, much to the <laughs> amusement lad. of his, good lad, um, good lad. his little rugby friends. He's a, he's a great rugby player, very able rugby player for his age. Oh, wow. And he absolutely knows that if he was ever to be good enough to play for his country, he would be playing for Wales. I'm not for one second saying he is, by the way, but he is a very able rugby player, bless him. Yeah. He, seems to, he seems to have it, whatever it is, he seems to have it. So... Um, Yes, I sadly don't speak very much Welsh anymore. I could speak fluent Welsh when I graduated, well, when I left school, I did, I did Welsh A-level, but oh, wow. I haven't lived in Wales for 25 years and you just forget it. I can yeah. read Welsh, I can, I, can, I can decipher Welsh when I read it, but if you were to start speaking to me in Welsh now, I would panic. I can sort of make myself understood, but I would, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's probably my West Whalian accent as well. You probably wouldn't start that. I don't understand myself. Never mind. Never. Okay. Well. Um. Well. In that, in, in mind, then. Um. We're going to a little bit of a, a different thing now. I'm going to give you ten quick fire questions. I haven't told you this because I never tell the guests because they all panic. So I'm going to give you ten quick fire questions. You can you can elaborate if if you'd like. So the first question we'll put the clock on now is fairly obvious, really clear. <laughs> rugby or football? Oh, rugby. Hate football. Can't get oh. my head around it. <laughs> okay um documentaries or a bit of reality a bit of a bit of trash tv definitely documentaries yeah yeah well as you say you know you're not really into the you're not a big fan of the the love island culture yeah. am I? oh my word no are you a glass half empty person or a glass half full I'm actually more of a glass half empty person which I think you'll find surprising and I wish I was the other way but I am a bit of a pessimist okay so. And, 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 and do you think that then, again, with all respect, is related to your, you, you mentioned that you suffer from low level depression. Is that is that part of it? Yes. And I think maybe my background, my upbringing. Um, yeah. yeah, I just, yeah, I just, I am a bit of a, of a pessimist and I need to be convinced something's going to go well. But I also think the fact that I'm a pessimist make me work, makes me work harder. Oh my God. I do don't think that? anything's going to be given to me on a plate. So, yeah. I, I, Claire, you just described me. That is unbelievable. I think exactly the same. Okay, wow. Um, maybe it's a Welsh thing. <laughs> uh, let's put this thing. Uh, red wine or white wine? <clears throat> white wine, but I don't really like wine. I don't drink very much, and wine I, I struggle with. Okay. Um, what would you say, then, is your greatest weakness? Chocolate. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> okay. So no wine, but plenty of chocolate. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm terrible for sugar. I, I really try not to eat too much of it, but I'm terrible for sugar. Okay. I love to, yeah. Okay. Uh, are you a morning person or a, a night person? Morning. E even when I was single, um, pre-kids, I would be up at seven o'clock going for a run. Yeah. I'm, I'm, oh. 
yeah i'm not and, a nice person at all and have you always kept fit i mean you keep fit yeah. now you look fit you you you, you know you, you've always kept fit yeah yeah no it's a lifelong passion yeah i i love it yeah there's been i used to be a rower um so there's there's different sports that i've done for various reasons and i would definitely admit that in my 20s i used to do it more to be smaller you know to to lose weight and sure. burn calories but um I, i've always engaged in fitness yeah it wasn't much rowing in Aberconnan, was it, really? No, at university. Yeah, I thought it so, was. Really. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was um, a good, still am a good rower. Good. Dogs or cats? Definitely dogs. I just don't get cats. Oh, don't God, don't get them. Oh, my God, you are, you are on my level. You really are. <laughs> um, what, what do you, well, I mean, it's a silly question, but what annoys you the most? Is there one thing that comes to the head straight away? Or is there this thing? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm very impatient. And I just want things done and I can't stick um, people that just doodle along, you know, sort of heads in the clouds. I just want things done quickly um, and I get frustrated in the workplace and at home if people are just All not right. doing things. Does that make you an impatient, like a, 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 a hard taskmaster then with, with regards well, to home and work? Yeah, I suppose so. Although I've done enough management training to realise that you have to adjust your <laughs> management style compared um, relating to who you're managing. So I, I now, um, I've, I've definitely improved in recent years and realised that to get the most out of people, you have to, you have to think, going into the, the way, their way of thinking and then uh, think, how can I yeah. get the best out of them using that? Okay, okay. Um, hot climate or cold climate? Hot. Never been skiing. No interest in going. Hate the cold. Hot, hot, hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and a couple more then. Um, who was your first childhood crush, Claire? Uh, Matt Goss from Bross. Oh, my word, right. Okay. The posters yeah. on the wall. Right. Yes. Although um, it might have been a bit younger. I can't remember. Do you remember Corey Haim and Corey Feldman? And there was a film called Licence to Kill. Um, license for license to drive. Sorry, not license to drive. Yeah, yeah, that that's the bond film. <laughs> yeah, that's the bond film. License to drive. They were like that sort of very young American. I remember. Brit, yeah. Uh, U.S. pack, yeah. brat pack type people. Brat pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With uh, Judd Hirsch and uh, all. Yeah, those, yeah, 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 and yeah. Rob Lowe and people like Rob that. Rob yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. and the final question then: uh, When was the last time you danced, or danced, as I say in Welsh? Oh, well, I dance with my little girl all the time. So we do Beyonce dance-offs in our <laughs> living room where we put Beyonce on YouTube. <laughs> She's okay. six, bless her. She loves dancing. So we, yeah, we um, we dance all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> and do the, I can, I can see now, do the old Beyonce moves, uh, you know. Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I always ask those questions because it sort of says a lot about people really from their answers um, straight away in a couple of minutes. Let's go back then, if we may. I know you started your 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 career as a news journalist and you worked for many newspapers, including the, the Sun, if I'm right. Um, and then you went to work for, well, what I term, you know, as an old man, your glossy magazines, uh, including Grazia, you know, Look, and now uh, the, the publication you work for. Is there a, is there a different way of working is there a different ethos um, yeah. between working for news a newspaper traditional and, and a magazine yeah so i started my career at the Aberdeer leader or the cannon valley leader it went oh wow the okay polls. yes i was only there very briefly um because i was then offered a place on the mirror graduate training scheme which is a very elite well was sadly no longer in existence a very prestigious the most prestigious graduate training scheme for journalists it was they get over 2,000 applicants for three places every year. So I was incredibly lucky to get onto it. Um, and, and I worked in newspapers for seven years. And I was given opportunities that a girl from the Valleys never could have imagined. So I flew all over the world. I was sent to places like South Africa, to LA, to the Caribbean, on stories, um, you know, given... Uh, 50 pounds a day to spend when you're there which you know if you think this was 20 years ago <laughs> quite a lot of money you know um and that's while staying in all-inclusive hotels it was just the most nuts time but it certainly wasn't the most healthy working environment um and this was a time when tabloid newspapers um maybe operated around the boundaries of ethics which they now work within because there's been many inquiries um 
looking into their practices. So this was a different time in tabloids. But some of the things that I got involved in as a and the sort of the stories I covered really affected me. And that's when I decided to go into um magazines because my mental health suffered when I was working for tabloid newspapers. So the I went to work for a magazine called Grazia, which is still in existence. I'm sure many people listening to this know Grazia. And it's just a very different world, just a much more acknowledgement of a work-life balance. Um, certainly not covering the type of news stories that really affect you mentally um and just a, a lot of fun when I, when I was at Grazia I used to cover the very A-list parties so one night I might be at a party chatting to Rod Stewart and then the following night I'd be going to fashion week parties with Stella McCartney you know it was just the most yeah where, whereas, wild existence yeah, yeah where, whereas working for a, a tabloid I suppose you'd be dealing with uh in, with with murder whatever yeah or child whatever. abuse and yeah. Yeah, violence against women, yeah. and yeah. it's just, and as someone who, um, I think I have quite a lot of empathy, which makes me a good journalist. I think you have to have a, a high level of emotional intelligence to be a good journalist. And but if you can absorb other people's feelings and emotions, and not you're not able to shake it off at the end of the day, that's going to affect you in the end. Yeah, well, I, I, as as you said, you, you suffered from you know anxiety and depression. So I, I, I mean, so in which case, then would you advise someone to become a journalist, considering it's not exactly the most healthy of jobs? <laughs> well, I think it's it's definitely changed. Um, I think um, the working practices are much better. There's definitely more acknowledgement of a work life balance, and I I do think journalism is is an amazing career if you want to see the world. Um, but you definitely need to be a certain type of person to do it. You need to be quite a robust person and able to detach yourselves. It's much like many other industries. Like I think in the police, I don't know how people who work in certain yeah. areas of the police yeah, function on a day-to-day -day basis or social workers. Goodness me, you know, I, I when I hear a friend of a friend is a social worker and I remember being at a barbecue, she was telling me some of the stuff she had to deal with and I just there's no way I could do it so I just need to make sure that you need to ensure that if you go into journalism certainly news journalism and you end up working for certain publications that cover certain types of stories you need to be very robust emotionally and able to detach at the end of the day yeah yeah I, I, my daughter-in-law is a, is a policewoman and uh, the stories she comes back with and I thought <laughs> god how the hell you do it yeah. so um, I, I, as someone from from Wales and, and I suffer from this myself did you ever, have you ever felt like a fish out of water? Have you suffered from imposter syndrome of some sort? Because I certainly do. Yeah, so I, I still do. Um, I've massively, you know, can't believe I'm in the room sometimes when I'm sat there with like the global president of Hearst or something. Mm. But um, I've got more confident um, as I've gotten older and more accepting of my accent. But when I was younger, even though I was determined not to lose my accent because I was Welsh, I was called all sorts of things. I was called thick because of my accent when I was um, a, a young newspaper reporter. I got pigeonholed into certain types of stories because I was a young working class, quite pretty young woman. So I got pigeonholed into trying to set up footballers or you know going to doorsteps to to make convince people to let me in and stuff so um yeah definitely if you think when i started in the media which was 1999 there was no hugh edwards reading the news no no, no there were hardly any welsh accents no, at all you're right yeah no. and i would have loved to have gone into broadcast and i think in fact i know i would have been very good at it because i've since i've media training and i do a lot of broadcasts now you know i contribute to tv and, and stuff like this i think i would have been a very good broadcast journalist and what held me back was my accent which is such a shame and that's holding myself back by the way i didn't i didn't go down the route of trying to to get my foot in the door but because i never started my journalism career apart from very briefly at the Aberdeen leader I started it on the mirror in London. So coming back to Wales and trying to get into BBC Wales didn't really seem like an option because I was already in London, but I didn't feel that I could get into the BBC yeah. because of my accent, which is a shame because I, I think I, I would have been very good at it. Yeah, I mean, it's quite sad, isn't it? I mean, I mean you're yeah. thinking back now, as you say, I mean, it's, it's still not too late, Claire. You could still do, um, you know, just just leave the magazine and go as a, you know, go as a, <laughs> as a broadcast journalist for BBC Wales. No, please don't, please don't. Um, 
we again we do again as editor in chief and you know you, you're obviously a, a very influential person within the the, the magazine industry again we come back to we, we talked a little on about the the ethos the message of the magazine is there a again by 2021 with everything that's happened in the last two three four years with black lives matter and that kind of thing is there a pressure to be all inclusive with regards to you know sizes shapes ethnicities a uh, bit of everything I, is that a pressure again i wouldn't call it a pressure it's a it's it's an, an ambition and a, and a very authentic ambition of mine that for the brand to be truly appealing to all then we need to be truly representative yeah. of all so we do try very hard to have a diverse representation on the cover. Um, I think we could do better on body shape on the cover, um, but when you've got 10 issues a year, it's, it's trying to, to find the, the cover stars for those 10 issues. Oh, and okay, then. well, let's talk about that quickly. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. I, I, I know you've had, you know, these amazing looking um, stars, women on, on your yeah. cover. For example, Halle Berry and uh, the uh, the Strictly Come Dancing um, dancer, what's her name? Diane uh, Baswell, yeah, uh, that yeah. went on sale today. Yeah. Right, okay, well, I mean, you know, I, I don't sound to be creepy here, but, but they're, they're, they're beautiful, um, uh, you know, bodies-wise, uh, faces-wise, everything-wise. But would you consider, or would you put, for example, someone like Rebel Wilson, or, I'd love to. or, or, or a, a, a larger lady. Again, that sounds yeah, like you yeah. saying that. Would, would oh, you do that? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I've, I've asked Rebel Wilson. She hasn't come back to me. <laughs> 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 oh, Rebel, how dare you? <laughs> I know, Rebel's ignoring me. Um, I even messaged her on social media. Um, yeah, no, I would I would love to. Yeah, I think, I so, think Rebel Wilson's amazing. Have you seen so, the, the wellness journey she's undergone? It's, it's incredible. She has an amazing story to tell. What the cover star on Women's Health needs to do is truly live a wellness lifestyle. So I can't have someone on there just because the way they look, whether they are that ah. be larger or smaller, they right. need to be someone who truly speaks to the values of the brand and someone who is trying to be the best version of their healthy self. So okay. we'd love to put Rebel Wilson on there. Um, so if she's listening to this, Rebel, please. Oh, yeah. Go on the cover of Women's Health UK, please. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll send a message to her tonight now. You and I both. I'm sure she'll come on. That's no problem. So we talked a little on, um, we're coming towards the end now. We talked a little on about uh, the future of the magazine. And I asked, you know, has things changed with regards to readership and, and uh, because of COVID or whatever? Again, do you actually see the, 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 the actual publication magazine carrying on in the future? Well, do you see yourself, do you see everything going? digitally completely is that the way it's going or no 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 i don't think so i think there'll always be a place for print um i think we're a long we're a long way off a long long way off outside of my career of it being a completely digital um proposition of publishing being a completely digital proposition i think people are a bit fatigued by tech and reading a magazine is an indulgent lean out experience is something that you do when you're sat on your comfy chair with a cup of coffee yeah. and you sort of get absorbed in the pages and it's very hard to recreate that feeling digital yeah by, by swiping on an ipad or whatever yeah. you're right yeah i mean yeah. I, I i'm still the generation like i mean i shouldn't say that i buy the western mail claire which only <laughs> which only takes me 10 minutes to read let's face it but i'm still <laughs> the generation that likes to buy an actual newspaper and go for a coffee and read the newspaper rather than have everything on my phone. But surely, the the you know the 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 older we get, as it were, and the younger generation comes in and they've been brought up in the digital world. Mm. Surely, that's what's going to happen, isn't it? They are going to be doing things on 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 iPads and phones or whatever, not by the actual publication. But if if that was true, then we'd no longer have books as well, and there's still bookstores on the high street. Yeah, so, bookstores have, have made a comeback. You're right. Yeah. It's all about it yeah. these days, and I know that that is, that is quite true. Okay, then. Well, listen. I know you're in your your sweaty um, um, clothes <laughs> at the moment. Uh, you obviously relax and switch off by keeping fit, by running, by canoe, um, rowing, and I know you've taken all, part in all kinds of challenges recently. Is that how you switch off as a well? Yeah. So I 
I use exercise as a, as a stress management tool, but I, I love it. I absolutely love exercise. I love how it makes me feel. There's, if you could, you know, put the post workout glow in a in a little jar and then you know sip it at the end of the day that would be amazing I think it's like no other no other drug but saying that I actually had some health tests recently um I went to a, a spa in Austria called Viva May and I had many 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 tests and they all came back with the same thing which said my body was stressed and they said that um, the stress markers were so elevated and the inflammation markers and the free radicals were imbalanced and the lactic acid was through the roof. And they said it was all to do with overtraining. And they said that if I was to continue on the route that I was on, it would lead to chronic disease because um, inflammation can lead to cancer, dementia, heart disease, etc. So there I was thinking I was making myself fitter and healthier by doing all the training I was doing you mentioned that I took part in various CrossFit competitions so I I was doing CrossFit training which is really high intensity and I was actually making myself unhealthy so I've actually I've dialed it back now so I am concentrating on strength training which everyone should do but especially women in their 40s because once you get into that perimenopause menopause stage when your um, hormones are fluctuating and ultimately dropping um, you're at a risk of osteoporosis. I don't know if you know what that is, but oh, yeah. it's where your, your bones can break because you lose bone density. And one simple way to preserve bone density is strength training. So women, especially women in their 40s, need to be strength training. I always have, but uh, um, I will continue to do so. So now what I'm doing is concentrating on strength training and I'm doing two 20-minute high-intensity sessions a week. So High intensity is when you go anaerobic, when you get really out of breath, you know, sweating, can't hold a conversation. So I'm doing two 20 minute sessions and that's for heart health because you do improve your cardiovascular health if you put your heart under pressure so it beats faster, etc. cetera. Um, and then I'm just walking, walking and stretching and yeah. I've been doing it for a month and I feel so much better. Already, feel, already, okay. All, yeah, so much better, I feel leaner, my skin is better. I'm not so tired. I'm not so stressed. So there was, yeah, there's, there's, there's a culture of hammering it, of really going for it every yeah. workout. Yeah. And it's not, it's not actually good. It's not me. actually healthy for you. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Which is weird, yeah. isn't it? Really? When you have those results back, were you, were you, were you shocked? Were you scared? Yeah, I was were really you? shocked. Yeah, really, really shocked. There was one test I did where they scanned my metabolism through breathing into a machine. And I scored the worst possible on every single marker. Now I'm someone who's just not used to being bad at things. Like without sounding arrogant, I like flew through school without trying. You know, I've always been, <laughs> I've always someone who just for some reason can be quite good at passing exams and tests and stuff. So I went out there thinking that I'm going to ace it. I thought, you know, I'm so fit, I'm so healthy, blah blah blah. <laughs> and then when I when they did all these tests and they come back and it was it was a shock it was a real shock yeah, so yeah. what they've said is that for me to train healthily and to be in the optimum fat burning zone your heart rate needs to be below 126 whereas my heart rate i was training over 160 over 170 so i've had to really adjust how i exercise to get the health so, benefits at least you have these results and in the plus surroundings of the spa at least that was a bit of a uh, a positive i suppose <laughs> It was a bit of a hardcore spa. It was the one that Rebel Wilson, who we've already discussed, it's the one that she went to to start her whole wellness journey because you know she used to be larger and she's, yeah. she's got much healthier. She went there and she has ever since credited that place with changing her life. Oh, there we are. That's your connection there. To try, yeah. try, try and I social media it again. There we are. I've tried, Chris. I've tried. I've tagged her and everything on social media. She's not I'll, listening to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll text her tonight. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, she'll be fine. She'll be fine. Ah, uh, good. Well, um, thank you so much uh, for your time, and uh, thank you for being for, to, so honest and, and open about your know, everything, your your life and career and everything. And how do people get hold then of the actual magazine? Uh, you know, in in obviously all good shops, is it? And obviously on websites as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's it's available in all you know all the supermarkets and W H Smith etc. They can subscribe when you get a better deal. If you subscribe, there's you know there's there's onboarding offers and even when you're outside the sort of three issues for five pound. Don't quote me on that, but you know it's those type of deals they offer. Yeah. You still get the magazine for cheaper. But the best way to become um, get the magazine is to become a member because we've just launched a membership uh, model called Women's Health Collective. And there's great deals at the moment too. And if you become a member, you get access to all the website, private Instagram, access to an expert panel, but you also get the magazine. And at the moment, that's five pounds for three months, which is oh, wow. a pretty incredible deal. So yeah, that's the that's the yeah. best way. Uh, and the website address? So it's women's health, um, women's health mag UK. Oh, what is the website address? <laughs> you don't I know. Yes, I know. Oh my god, my favorite. <laughs> It's because <laughs> it's just on my it's on my bookmark. I don't have to. Right, so it's womenshealthmag.com forward slash UK forward there slash. Are. So there, there you go. <laughs> Ah, ah, excellent. Oh, thank you so much. Again, thank you so much for your time. Um, and before I leave you go, I'm gonna spring one more thing on you. You can have a bit of a you can have a bit of a break. You can have two weeks on a desert island just by just by yourself, okay? No yeah. kids. Get someone to look after the kids for two weeks, you'll be fine. And the and the, the magazine, obviously. What's the one thing you insist on taking with you to this desert island to make life a bit more bearable there's no there's no plugs on this island so you can't take well you could take your mobile phone i suppose but it'll yeah in, in a couple of days what's the one thing you have to take with you so i'd say spf because <laughs> if you're on a desert island you yeah. you know go look after yeah. the skin yeah. but that's the that, so that would be the practical thing but if i'm allowed to my second one was i love political autobiographies so a big chunky political biography that's what i would take with me to get me through that's my uh, anyone in particular Oh, I've just finished Barack Obama's, um, David Cameron's I've just done. So I don't know what one I want next. So if any any tips then someone people should tell me. It doesn't matter what party they're from. I particularly like American politics because I think it's fascinating and a bit bonkers how it functions. Okay. Um, so, you know. And maybe two weeks on an island, Claire, you could read a few Welsh books and brush up a new Welsh. I could. 